So my name is Vinicius Carvalho. Uh, I'm, I'm a platform architect for Pivotal, which uh, allows me to have some very interesting conversations with our customers. So one of the perks of being a platform architect here is uh, we get a chance to talk to our customers, understand their needs and what's happening in the, in, in, in the industry, and tr sometimes translate that back into better products for you guys. Right? And I'm also fortunate enough to be in the New York office where uh, some of the Spring Cloud Stream guys and Spring Cloud Dataflow uh, are present, and I'm always chasing them down and uh, asking for new features and things like that. So what I'm gonna present here today is actually gonna be available on Spring Cloud Stream 1.1. It's already on the master branch, so by the time we finish here, uh, if you wanna just go and give it a try, we appreciate, we want feedback. This is a very uh, early stage for us. Uh, around this cheesy name that we chose, uh, Resilient and Evolutionary Data Microservices. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so the agenda, um, I'm gonna talk ve very briefly about what are data microservices, right? But I'm not gonna dive in too much into that. There are better sessions for you guys to understand this and better presenters. I'm gonna point you to the right direction, but we have to at least mention. Uh, then I'll try to convince you why Schema evolution is important for building resilient and evolutionary data microservices. Uh, and we'll hopefully we'll converge into the idea that it's actually all about the format, okay? Uh, and then we'll introduce the evolution uh, support in Spring Cloud Stream 1.1 and a demo. And all that in under 28 minutes. So bear with me for a second. Uh, okay, so what are data microservices, right? Uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, so they, they, they have most of the, the features of uh, traditional microservices. They're self-contained. You don't need an ESB to run data microservices, right? Uh, they're loose couple. They don't have traditional RPC mechanism where they have to obey to certain rules. They're actually loose coupled and message oriented sometimes. Uh, they're independent. You, you, you don't need to deploy them in certain order. They can be deployed on any order. Uh, they're usually even driven. And data aware is a horrible term, but Bear with me, I'm not a nat native English speaker. I can't name things in Portuguese, it's even worse in English. Uh, but what I was going for is that usually you're designing a data microservice, you're thinking about partitioning, uh, data uh, affinity, collocation, and things like that, right? So if you ask me, yes, data microservices are pretty much this, right? It's the new unicorn. So we, we love unicorns, uh, and so that's the newest one around the block. Um, if you're familiar with Spring uh, Cloud integration, if you were in the talk before that Michael and Glenn gave uh, and they asked about Spring integration, one of my favorite frameworks uh, inside Spring. Uh, this is a traditional Spring uh, integration. So you could think about data microservice. One of the utilization is that if you want to break down your integration into smaller subsystems uh, and, for example, deploy in a platform such as Cloud Foundry, Right, so you could create and scale independently each one of those. The platform would give you the resiliency that you expect. So uh, HA, right, monitoring, this comes from the platform. Uh, what Spring Cloud Stream gives to you is the ability to, first, it's a programming model, uh, and second, it's the ability to abstract the binder APIs, which is how those systems communicate with each other. It's upper to the binder, and right now we have binders for Kafka, RabbitMQ, uh, Google PubSub and JMS. Okay, those last two are experimental, but they're there. Uh, you can switch those without uh, needing uh, to change your code. Another thing they're good for, data pipelines. I'm not gonna dive into that. There's a horrible, I, I just needed to have this slide. Uh, but now, I wanna talk about something here. Uh, if you're familiar with this, this is from Sam Newman's book on building microservices. Uh, and I wanna use this as to set the stage for our conversation today. Uh, so context maps, right, and bounded context, I mean, domain-driven design. This, is, this has been uh, really uh, up in the industry uh, in the few years when microservices arose. Uh, but one of the things I want you guys to notice is, so I have two contexts here, right? I have warehouse and I have finance. And in between, I have this shared model, right, which is uh, a stock item. Uh, the problem with that, right, and usually the communication between across bounded contexts, they are asynchronous, which is a good fit for data microservices and spring cloud stream. But the problem with that is this guy here. Uh, who owns that, right? It's easy for you to version and evolve your bounded contexts, 
But now when you're crossing the boundaries, right, when you're sending an event that you don't even know how many consumers you have, when you evolve or you change the schema of that data, what happens, right? So this is one of the problems that we face in an industry, okay? Uh, another thing that data microservices are good for, my favorite four letter uh, acronym that no one knows what really is. Uh, so, I, I, me neither. So I just want to put it here because it's a good example for data microservice utilization, but I want to point out for the fact that if you're using CQRS, uh, there is this thing called a, uh, a write model and a read model. Uh, and the choice that we made for Spring Cloud Stream version one of schema registry, that is very important. The idea that you have different writers and, and readers and how those schemas are combined. So that's why really I wanted to pull this. Now, if you really want to learn about uh, data microservices, you go to Mario's talk, right? He's the expert on this subject. You go to Elia and Eric and Fred. So those are the guys you want to follow, not myself. Um, now, what, what did I mean when I said evolutionary, right? I really mean that what happens when your data evolves, right? I'm pretty sure mo most of you here, are at least in one project, that you're upgrading your Struts application to the newest kit on the block, right? And I'm pretty sure they're still connecting to the same Oracle database, right? So your data is there, you're just changing the, the, the stack. Uh, but sometimes data has to evolve, uh, and because of this, data actually outlives code. I, I like to say that, I mean, uh, the proof of that is what I just said. You're connecting the same data storage uh, and your code evolves. But when they, uh, the opposite happens, we're not doing a good job on that, to be honest. And there's actually a field of study on this. It's called the schema evolution, right? which is the problem of evolving a data schema to adapt to a change in modern reality from Wikipedia. Uh, so we're so bad at this as an industry right? that if you think about RDBMSs that have been around for decades, Flyway, which is a very interesting uh, framework for allowing you to do database migration, has been around for only five years. Uh, so in, in the, the message ecosystem and the event-driven and data microservices, we're still on our first steps. And I really wanted us to think about this uh, right now as opposed to as an afterthought. So that's what this is all about. And when we talk about schema evolution, there's two things you want to learn about. Uh, very simple. So backward compatibility. So it means you have a newer consumer that's reading data from an older version and it won't break. So you're pretty much emitting data in V1, and if you create a V2 consumer, your consumer is not gonna break because of that. And the, the opposite is you, you have a new producer in a new version, and you, you have older uh, consumers reading that information, okay? So, and of course, the combination of both we call full compatibility, and the opposite of that is, is no, none, right? So you don't have any compatibility. Um, now, on the request response paradigm, um, it's a little bit easier if you think when you talk about traditional REST, uh, REST microservices, because you, you, you want to get something. Usually, I don't care how you version, you should using the URI, I, I'm going to ask for a, a specific version, and a client for the newest version will ask for uh, the particular version. For example, the Cloud Controller API has new features on V3. Uh, it's not pushing down that data to any client. It's actually, okay, if you, want that, if you want that, you know the contract, you will adapt to that, um, right? So it's really about a handshake. So you have a handshake process, uh, it, sh it should be fine. Messaging subsystems are not so easy because they're decoupled. So if I have a channel and I'm emitting data, right? So I have now the recommendation system in V1, and I, I just decided to upgrade to V2. This is what we have been doing so far. Right? There's enterprise integration patterns. There's this, in, this guy, in this case here, uh, it's the, the content router. So you create a content router and you say, okay, I'm going to route messages to the right endpoint based on certain rules. Well, the problem is every time you create a new version of your data, you will have to refactor your content router. Uh, there's other ways of doing that. You could use transformations. You can use a content enricher right, and transform data at the endpoint and ESB vendors love that because now everything is within the ESB. So they, their hub and spoke architecture uh, is the central place for truth and you're locked in forever. Uh, so there's, like, Willy Wonka would ask you, right? So 
I thought a microservice were all about smart endpoints and dumb pipes. By putting those rules, you're actually not creating uh, dumb pipes because you're putting a lot of the logic inside uh, the, the communication tier itself. So what we really want here is a smart endpoints. Okay, so we want to be able to create applications for Spring Cloud Stream that can cope with the evolution uh, of data without requiring changes on the system itself. I don't have to rewrite my uh, router or create a transformation for that. Uh, and the way to achieve that, it's actually, it's actually simple. It's surprisingly simple. That's the only reason I'm here, because if it were complex, I would not be able to accomplish. Uh, so we have the tools, okay? We just need to evolve on how to use it. Um, and the, the tools have been around for a while, and just recently we started really using that. And to be honest with you, it's all about the format. It's gonna be all about what format do you use to serialize your payload and send over the, uh, the wire. Because depending on the format, you will have more uh, uh, features on how can you actually support evolution of data, right? So we craft out five features that we think it's interesting for a system to have to support data evolution, a schema evolution, right? So we want it to be, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I'm that guy. Uh, we want it to be compact, right? Not UXML, I'm looking at you, okay? We want it to be strongly typed, not you, JSON. I'm looking at you, right? And again, another bad choice of word, we want it to be adaptable, which means like I would like a, a format that allows it to be uh, evolved without too much uh, changes in the system itself, right? So if, I, if I have a format that allows that, that would be preferable. Um, not on the format itself, but on the system, I would like to version those things, and I would like to be centralized. So that very la two last things is where we're gonna talk about the schema registry server, right? So where we, we store all our schemas. Uh, and when we start choosing the formats, right? So those are the most popular formats we have today. Yes, yeah, CSV is still around. If you're doing integration, it's gonna, you're gonna see that. Uh, JSON, unfortunately, uh, still there. Uh, and XML, of course. Those are the text-based. Uh, text and then the binary formats, uh, Avro, Cryo, and Proto buffers. And all of those, they have strengths and weakness, and we had to pick one for Spring Cloud Stream 1.1, right? Uh, so let's look at some metrics, why we chose the one. Uh, so payload size, right? What we're trying to uh, show here is Avro, for example, is six times smaller than XML. That's the same data. So the data here, um, we simulate uh, the Android API for sensor data. Uh, so all the things like magnetic field, orientation, acceleration, temperature. So there's a bunch of fields there. You say, okay, how much does it cost to serialize that data in different formats, right? Uh, uh, JSON doesn't stack any, any better, right? So it's uh, three, at least three times, a little bit over three times more than, uh, than, the, than Avro, right? And because JSON is so popular and people are still thinking about JSON and using JSON, uh, we ran a little bit on the performance of uh, writing and reading. So this is uh, raw writing and reading with using Jackson and, and the Avro Marshaller. And it's consistently two, two and a half times slower. So uh, run this test, uh, it's on GitHub, you'll find it uh, hundreds of thousands of times. We remove uh, outliers and this is consistent. Uh, so it, you have to think it. I mean, you're, if you're using JSON, you're choosing something that is two and a half times slower, three times bigger. Uh, you have to start asking yourself, why? I mean, JSON is really good at the endpoint, edge gateways, talk to browsers, talk to, to the rest endpoints. But if you're doing data microservices, and if you really want to uh, uh, use hundreds of thousands of messages per second, you should be rethinking the, uh, uh, the serialization format, right? Uh, and benchmarks, right? We love benchmarks, we need a benchmark. Came up with this crazy thing that I, I wanna feel good about myself because I, we chose one format. So uh, structure, how, how structured those, uh, those types are. Uh, most of the binary formats are really well structured uh, and it comes to, uh, and then it comes to evolution, how do they support evolution? So to be fair with XML, right? XML has been around for a while. XML is actually quite good in the schemas. There's XSDs are part of XML. I mean, ever since we dumped DTD. Uh, 
but the, the way that XML solves the evolution problem is by adding more XML, called XSLT. So when you have two versions of a payload in XML and you want to make them combine, you create another small snippet of XML, called, which is the transformation to change that. Uh, I don't think that that solves the problem, okay? Uh, and I really, I mean, if I'm on a crusade against JSON now, ever since I start really looking into this, reading uh, uh, about it and trying to dig on the problem, so I would say that JSON is bad, right? So if you can take anything about this presentation, is, is that. Um, so yeah, we, we chose Avril as the first implementation. Uh, as everything with Spring, uh, I think uh, Spring is, is about choice. So Avro is the first one, but everything is in there ready for any other format. Like, so uh, the clients of Spring Cloud Stream, I mean the client side where the producers and consumers, the sync and sources, they use message converters. Uh, there's a, a special message converter for Avro. Uh, JSON, pro I mean, although I hate JSON, uh, JSON is probably the next one. There is, there is a, a tentative JSON schema um, uh, uh, which is not a standard yet, but there is something out there, and XML may be also uh, one. So why did we choose that? Why did we choose Avro? So okay, it's binary and compact. You saw it's really small. Uh, it's, it's a very mature project with an active community, and it's heavily used in the Hadoop ecosystem. So it's not like, hey, we chose this because, yeah, we chose this. Um, schemas are first-class citizen, so Avro, has the schemas as the first thing that you think about when you create an Avro generic record or a, a uh, specific record. Uh, it has out of the box support for schema evolution. That's part of Avro. Like Avro says, uh, if I have two schemas, I can combine them and create a schema uh, resolution and make sure that writers and readers can coexist. Of course, sometimes the schemas will break. It doesn't mean that, oh, can, does it mean I will write schemas and it will always work? No. But it will give it best, and if you there's uh, um, uh, patterns and in, in, in for you to write your schemas in Avril, so it will make sure that you are evolving them correctly. Uh, and I wish I had submit a one-hour talk, and we would uh, talk about that. Uh, and the other thing is Avril supports generic records, so generic records are like glorified hash maps. Uh, the good thing about that, it's easy to integrate with Spring in, uh, expression language. Uh, and to me, that's, that's huge, because now I can create generic consumers that I can just create expressions on top of the payload. Uh, that's not that easy with proto buffers, for example. I really like proto buffers. I really like gRPC and what's going on in that spec. Uh, but uh, proto buffers are not that easy to decouple, uh, like the definition, the IDL, and the, and the class implementation, the, the POJOs. Uh, and Avro has cross-language implementations. Okay. How does it work in Spring Cloud Stream? We're gonna dive into a demo, but I'm gonna give you like the high level uh, uh, overview. So we have uh, a schema registry, right? A schema registry is just a, a simple uh, a REST server, which actually talks JSON. Um, but, so, but the idea is it stores the schemas, and it's the, 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 one of the key points is when you register a schema, it's an idempotent uh, operation. The importance of that is if you have multiple uh, producers or applications who are using the same schema and trying to declare that, they will always get the same version, right? So it's, that, it's the one that actually mandates your versioning. Uh, in that way, we could have separate teams working on that using the same schema file when their applications start and they actually broadcast their schemas, they would get back the same ID. Uh, it has su uh, uh, test, uh, support compatibility tests. So, for example, let's say that you have five schemas registered in your schema registry, and now you're evolving the data. Your API evolved from version five to six. You change a few fields, you add fields, you remove fields. You can run a test against the registry, and it will tell you uh, among all the schemas that are registered, uh, which ones it will break compatibility or will be compatible with. So now you know, up, uh, you know ahead of time that, okay, I'm breaking compatibility. I better take a look into this. <laughs> And one of the features we want to add, it's not here, spoke with Marius this morning, um, is tracking utilization. So after you figure out that you're breaking schema version five, you know who, who are the consumers and producers of version five so you can take the necessary uh, measures to, 
to work before you just start sending data and things break, right? So the flow is the producer will register a schema. I'm going to show code for that and the demo. Uh, and once it registers the schema, the schema register returns a location, which is the exact uh, version of that schema, and that gets propagated in the header of the message, right? So now when the consumer picks that up, which by the way, this is the example we have, uh, we're, we're gonna demo something like, I have an API level 16 of Android, and an API level 21, and I have a consumer of 21, and I want to read data from the 16 version, right? So what this guy will do is, it will, okay, uh, he just morphed into the previous version. Um, so it will fetch the message, right? It will query the registry for, uh, for the schema. Uh, and if there, is, if there is a version, if the version is different, it apply the schema resolution, which is part of Avro itself. Uh, the, it, the cool thing is you don't, on the consumer side, you don't even have to set the content type because that's part of the, of the, of the header. So it infers that it's, a, it's an Avro message and it knows the, the version so it can actually uh, 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 apply the schema evolution, okay? So starting the server itself, just like any Spring Boot, just like most of the projects with Spring Boot, is a matter of putting one annotation called at enable schema registry server, right? So that's a separate boot app you can just create with any boot starter, import Spring Cloud Stream 1.1, and say enable schema registry server. There's a few configurations for, for you to, to tune, but in a nutshell, we'll start the server and bind to an H2 database, or if you bind to any database leveraging Spring Cloud connectors, it will just use that as a backend store for you. So the schemas will be uh, stored in a database. Uh, now, those are the, 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 the main endpoints. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this because this is, uh, again, uh, we just, started this, so this may change. I don't think the feature, features will change, the endpoints may change. So the important thing is, when you post a schema, again, it's an idempotent operation, always return the same version, right? Uh, you can ask for a schema of a given format, and right now we only support Avro, uh, and it returns that schema definition, or you can get all the schemas for that format in, in a given subject. Uh, you can post a, a schema to test, uh, to run the compatibility test, or you can get the utilization. So you say, okay, list all the apps that are using this version of this schema. So that, in a nutshell, those are uh, uh, the, the top uh, features that we wanna have in the, on the schema server. On the client side, when you're creating the application, right? So assuming that your schema registry is running, now you're gonna write uh, a, uh, a Spring Cloud Stream application, right? So the first thing is enable schema registry client that triggers the converter in, in Spring Cloud Stream that, that knows how to connect to Spring, uh, a, a registry, that knows how to marshal into uh, Avro or the, the format, and that knows how to set the headers properly. Right? So it does all automatically for you. And you need this for both uh, apps that are sources uh, or syncs or even processors or both. Um, um, extra configuration for that, producers, uh, you, you set the endpoint, where is, where is it located? By default, this is actually optional, by default we'll try localhost 8990, that's the default where the schema registry will start, just like uh, 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 config server, for example, it starts on 8888, uh, and then if you don't tell your, discover, uh, your config client, it will connect to 8888, we follow the same approach, uh, and of course, uh, we want to have support for connectors, so we're going to deploy in Cloud Foundry. VCAP services are going to be first-class citizen where we can parse that and connect to the client or to the server. Uh, the, the other thing is your bindings, right? You have set the binding output to application Avro. That will also trigger that uh, uh, the right uh, uh, message converter. Um, on the consumer side, it's even simpler. Uh, we, what we do is schema register client, which is optional, and you don't have to say anything about the content type because it can infer it from the headers. So it will get the headers, oh, this is a Avro, and there's another header that tells it's an expanded content type. It's gonna be application slash VND dot uh, subject dot Avro 
plus version or something like that. Marius can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so for, for the example, that I want to show you guys this in action. There is a simple example here for the backward compatibility. Um, what we're going to do is these are, and I'm, I, I'm, I am truly sorry for this, uh, but if you download the, the PPT, uh, you'll be able to, to at least see. But the, the idea here is I have two schemas uh, for, for a sensor data, right? Uh, so V1 used to have a field called temperature. On V2, we, add, we added a few fields, and adding fields are actually easy. Most formats will support addition of fields without breaking. But uh, in here, we're actually changing the name of the field. And that's one of the things that breaks the schema pretty bad. Because now you, you need to access it using internal temperature, but version one is sending as temperature. Uh, so this is going to be schema evolution kind of in action, right? So it's time for the demo. Um, so the first thing I will do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the server, right? It's a, I'm sorry. I, there you go. <laughs> Apologize for that. So I'm going to start the server. And the server is just a boot app, right? It, it really has just the annotation at enable schema registry server. It will start, uh, create a database in, in, in H2 database. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to query that server for I'm going to query for a specific uh, type, the sensor type. So I want to say, okay, give me all the, the, the schemas that you have for the Avril format on the entity sensor, which is the one that we're registering, right? And the first time, uh, not found, there's nothing there, okay? Nothing is, 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 is in, in, this, in this schema server. Uh, so if I can find my mouse, okay. Now, so, so this is the, the producer application, right? Like I said, it's very simple. It's just enable schema registry. And the producer itself, right, is just a source. This is old code. There's a better way for you to create polling operations in Spring Cloud Stream. I acknowledge that. Uh, but we've been working with this for a while. Um, and we just re generate random data, right? Uh, the only thing I do is I append uh, a version at the end of the ID, of the random ID. So at least we know that which version are we reading. So when I run this here, what's going to happen behind the scenes is as soon as we start producing messages, and it's using a RabbitMQ binder, right? So Spring Cloud Stream will take care uh, about creating the the uh, the exchange, uh, if I go to, the, to RabbitMQ now, you can see the exchange, and start producing data, but we we'll register that schema for me. So if I go back uh, to my console, and if I run this again, what I get back is the, is the schema for that type that was registered for me, right? So, so it tells me, okay, you have se a sensor in the version one, uh, and those are all the fields uh, that are part of that, uh, that POJO. Now, if we go back and run the version two of that application, which is exactly the same, it just, instead of broadcasting temperature, it has a, it renamed the field to internal temperature. Let's, we run this, and what's going to happen here, the same as before, it will start broadcasting random data, and we'll register to the schema registry. And now, run a clear here, now, if I, if I do a get now, so you see I have two versions. I could start and stop as many times as I want any of those versions. There's not going to be an increase of, of schemas because the, ver the schema server will uh, match schemas with registered schemas and see if they are the same before it actually increments the versioning of that. Uh, and now let's, let's fire the, uh, the consumer. Uh, let me show you the consumer code. So the consumer code, uh, this is the version two of the consumer, right? So it means that it knows what is internal temperature. It has no idea what temperature is. So if this were our traditional model, right, I would be trying to access a POJO by the name internal temperature, and I would get errors, right? Because I said, okay, 
your version one just send me something with temperature, you're missing the field. Uh, what's going to happen here is when it's V2, that's fine. When it's V1, it will run the schema resolution and there is, I don't think, I, was fa I think I was fast enough, uh, I was too fast. Uh, there's an alias on the field internal temperature of version two that says, hey, prior versions were used to call these as temperature, right? Uh, so if I run this guy, it may be hard to see. It's going to be tough to see. I don't know if you guys are going to see, but the whole idea is it's showing internal temperature. Uh, and sometimes I get a, 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 a V2 or a V1, and both are being able to be read. So you can expand this to more, way more complex examples, right, when, you, when, you, uh, when you're doing backward compatibility as well. Uh, and when you're actually using generic records on your consumers, this is where things get really powerful because you really don't depend on the generated classes, right? This thing here is actually using the generated classes from Avril. So F from the schema five, I generated a, uh, schema two, I generated a POJO and created the consumer. Okay, so um, this is all available right now in the master branch. Uh, we're, we hope to have this by 1.1. Uh, please uh, use fire away your, your you know, questions, comments, and We'll love to hear feedback on this. We just think that this is a really important thing if we're really going for uh, resilient data microservice pipelines. Um, if, you, if you get my session later, there's a ton of references here. I would re really recommend you guys to check one of, uh, some of those. Um, so there's a bunch of that, uh, uh, things here. Most of the things that Martin Kleppman wrote is pretty awesome. Um, I think I have five minutes, so I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Um, Okay. Yeah. It's already there. So <laughs> yeah. So so I didn't have time. Thirty minutes. So the the consumer piece supports the default one, which is this, or the Kafka one, right? The thing with the the, the one from Confluent is if you're not using Kafka, for example, if you're using RabbitMQ, uh, the the Confluent schema registry really depends on Kafka. So you need to bring the entire stack, Kafka, Zookeeper, right, and the registry. If you want something simpler, you can just use that. But it's already there. Yeah. So, no, I mean, we, so we created a POJO just for the version two, okay? Not for all the, 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 the schemas. Yeah, we create, in this example, yes, we create it manually. So what happens is at the consumer level, it knows V2, right? But when it receives a message from V1, it goes to the schema registry and fetch that. And then it uses Avro schema resolution to, to understand which, how is the field mapping between the older versions and the newer versions, how they map, and how you can read it, okay? Uh, if you're using uh, the generic record, then you don't even need to do that, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I'm a really big fan of the generic record because of that. It, it, doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't bind you to an uh, implementation. Yeah, the registry, yes. It's just a, it's just a REST server. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so it's, uh, it's right here. Um, this, this source here, so this is an Avro format. No, no, it's, you will design that. So you design that schema, right? Uh, this is how you work with Avro. You design a schema, um, and you can generate a class, um, right? Just like uh, proto buffers is the same, right? Uh, and then that creates a class for you. 
and then this schema gets stored. Now here's one thing that I actually forgot to say. Uh, we also support reflection. So let's say that you don't have the schema. I don't encourage you guys to go for the reflection piece, but uh, we can infer a schema out of a class, create this, that schema, and send to the registry. Right? We can also, uh, if you don't have the schema file, if you have uh, the specific record class, that has a schema method that returns the schema that generated that POJO. So even if you just have a jar with all the, the, the classes, we can extract the schema from there. No, we actually try to avoid that. So we, we have this, the registry itself versioning it. So we, it can be idempotent. Because otherwise, two teams could actually think that are in version two, or one is in two and three. So you create your schema, you send it, and you get a version back, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I think I know. So one of the the fundamental difference that we have is that uh, we we don't we didn't break. So if you have a consumer that's just reading, as long as you can read Avril, we don't uh, we don't pollute the payload, okay. right? So basically, so if you have, I could introduce this right now. Uh, so the the ones that are the uh, former versions, like running already running, they would still consume that data, right? Uh, without breaking. So the new ones that are, have the registry client enabled, they'll be able to fee, uh, leverage this feature. Because it's just, it's just, a, it's just an, a, a serialization of an error type. That's it. So, so, so the framework handles that for you, right? So all the communication between the, sorry? Okay, so the question is, um, is there a way for the client, um, if, if I understand correctly, right? Uh, not do the programmatic way of trying to register the schema and read the schema, and if you evolve the schema, the client to know that up, uh, uh, up front. So uh, yes, I mean, it's actually what we do. So the. Uh, all this communication with the registry, if it's Confluent or ours reg our registry, it's all done automatically for you. And, 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 the, and here was a backward compatibility example, but forward compatible examples are pretty nice for you to demonstrate that. If you have a system running, like if I had a V1 consumer instead of V2, and I just started a V2 producer, as long as they're compatible, you don't have to do anything, okay? it will automatically go to the confluent. It, it uses as many things in, in Spring. We're, we're doing um, class path scanning detection, and you do need to set that you're using confluent endpoint, but that's it. And it, the, the, the client is an interface for a schema registry client, and there's one for the default one, and there's one for confluent. That's an automatic Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're done, right? Yeah, so guys, uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, we can, we can talk until break or find me in the break rooms. Okay, thank you guys.